welcome to RPG Heroes, a podcast where every other week I speak to a true hero in the realm of role-playing games about their journey, their craft, and their views. As your host, I will focus on one particular aspect of this wonderful hobby for the interview, regale you with stories from my own 25 years of experience with role-playing games, and reflect on the major takeaways from the interview. Join me now on this epic journey and awaken the hero in you. Welcome to episode 23. This episode is all about long campaigns in role-playing games. Today we are joined by not just one RPG hero, but five. I have invited the five players of my long-term Dungeons & Dragons campaign because we just wrapped up this very long campaign. We played for nearly four years And, uh, well, they have a lot to say about it, so you'll hear all that in the interview. And before we do that, I have my own conclusions as well. So, what do you need to create a long-term role-playing game campaign that can last a long time and stay strong all the way until the epic ending? Well, I think it all starts before the campaign actually begins. Um, I think especially if you're going to be doing a longer term campaign, a session zero as it's called, so a conversation with the potential players about what it's going to be about, what rule set to use, um, what kind of homebrewing you expect to be doing, um, what kind of atmosphere, what type of characters and stories you can expect, all those kind of things. Uh, There are plenty of really good resources online for how to do a session zero. Um, But in general, you're basically asking questions to your potential players uh, to get an idea of what they would like and you're telling them what you would like and hopefully you can meet somewhere in the middle and that creates a lot of buy-in from the players because don't forget for the game master it is a huge investment in time sometimes also money for books but mostly time and effort uh, to create such a campaign but for a player it's also it's it's a pretty big commitment to say yeah sure let's play a campaign for years every week or every other week or whatever the frequency of your games are is um so you need people to really have the buy in that they don't say after a couple of weeks actually it isn't what i expected i'm going to leave and then it, you know your story will suffer for it so you need this solid group of players. Of course, anything can happen over the course of a couple of years. And it's not the end of a campaign, usually, if one player leaves and another player joins. But if half the group leaves because this is not what they wanted, well, then all your work kind of goes down the drain. So a session zero, I think, is essential for any long-term campaign. And of course, then the willingness of you and the players to kind of meet in the middle and create something that everybody would like and should you find out during this session zero that the idea that you have for your campaign or the type of game that you would like to run is not for everyone it's not for the group that you're talking to well then you can draw the conclusion let's not run this campaign for this particular group that's okay Um, you can do something else or you find another group The next thing that I think really helped me with my campaign uh, is a robust framework for your story. So some long campaigns can at some point become a bit aimless. We're just walking around trying to do stuff, but I'm not sure where it's going and and neither does the game master. uh, And that can be frustrating. Oh, don't get me wrong. That can also still be fun if it's done well. Um... But in my case, I I thought, okay, I need some sort of framework to to hang the story upon to make sure that across the years that we're going to be playing this, there is some sort of consistent story and that the players can feel that and notice that and feel that they are part of something really, really big. And uh, well, in my case, I chose the framework of the sentence uh, in quotation marks, uh, which I've learned from the Great Game Master YouTube channel. I'll put a link in the show notes. He also writes about it in his book, The Complete Guide to Creating Epic Campaigns, which is that, the sentence, plus a whole lot more. It's it's wonderful. I recommend it. It, I think it's uh, it's good reading material for any game master who would like to create an epic campaign in any type of system. And what this sentence boils down to is somebody wants something badly and is having trouble getting it. And in the case of my campaign, the big bad evil 
uh, it was trying to get pieces of some ancient tablet which had some sort of secret uh, um, formula on it um, and had, had trouble getting it because it was hidden all over the world. And the other reason he, had, he or it um, had trouble getting it uh, was the players. And that's, of course, where the players get involved and where the friction between the players and the main nemesis or big bad evil, whatever you want to call it, uh, starts to occur and gets worse and worse and worse all the way to the end. And this is a great framework for drama because I know what my main character wants, just like the players know what their characters want. And we have a reason to keep antagonizing each other, as it were. And the cool thing is, for me at least, once you flesh out that sentence and start thinking in more detail, like, okay, what could it be that this creature or this enemy wants? Uh, what could it be for? What is the purpose? Um, what, you know, what are the goals, the long-term designs of this enemy? And why is this such a bad thing for the players? Why should the players want to oppose the big bad evil rather than just joining them or ignoring them so there has to be some reason that puts pressure on the players to do something about it uh, to be that trouble to get stuff and this whole process really helped me with my creativity and um, it sparked all sorts of ideas and i decided that it wasn't one thing but it was parts of a tablet so that i knew i would have lots of material for a long long time they had to find 12 13 pieces of a tablet and um, of course the opposition was trying to do the same so here and there they would see oh no no we're in competition here we need to be faster or we need to be cleverer etc and this sparked dozens and dozens and dozens of main quests but also side quests and all those sort of things and uh, well it, it helped me immensely and each time when i was preparing i would go back to the sentence and think okay how is it progressing is the main evil still having trouble getting it uh, is it getting worse what how is this creature going to respond to the opposition how is it going to respond to the fact that it's not going as they want etc are they going to ramp up whatever they're doing answer yes um yeah and, and, and yeah so it, it it kind of helped me to touch base with my story every time i sat down to prepare so that the whole thing the whole campaign feels like a solid uh, story the next ingredient that i think is crucial for a long running campaign is cool side quests so of course the main story the main quest is the most important part of the campaign um, but if you want to be able to run a, a campaign for a long time um, it helps to not just focus on the main story. Also, it can help to make it feel more like a series or like a, a, a long set of movies, like a trilogy, etc., where always there, there is a main story, but there are also things happening on the side. And sometimes a couple of characters have to go in a different direction and do something else for a little while. It also helps to prov to, to um, prevent um, the players or even the game master from burning out on this particular story, getting bored of it. Um, and one great video that I can recommend on this is by Matthew Colville, where he talks about the A plot and the B plot. Um, and he says, so the A plot is the main story and the most important bit, and the B plot is not related to it. Um, but also interesting and you can make it so that the a plot keeps running no matter how long people stay on the b plot and therefore gets more difficult or worse or whatever it is and the b plot is something if you ignore it for long enough it can become a problem as well and this presents the players with meaningful choices the next ingredient is closely related to this because I think that it's important in a long-term campaign um, that as a game master you care about the characters and their backgrounds uh, and you can you have time and space to um, to put their personal stories of the characters into the campaign and make them feel like a an essential part of the story. Um, so what I did, for instance, was I asked each of my players, so where is your character from? Why are they adventurers? Um, wh what is their general goal in life? And uh, what, what's something odd or, or scary that happened to them? And 
I use this information uh, to look back at my main story and say, well, how could they be somehow tied into this main story? Why? Why are they the ones that have to suffer through this whole adventure? Um, And that really helped me to create side quests and create moments that at at that time feel like they're only really related to the character. And later they find out, oh, wait, that's why I am the blah, blah, blah in the story. And this is a great way to make the players feel appreciated for being part of such a large campaign. Uh, and it also helps them to, you know, to to really feel like their character and their choices, that they really matter in the whole grand scheme of things. The next ingredient that I think really helps for a long-term campaign is to have memorable NPCs that return, that they can visit again and again, or that they meet every now and then, or even that attacks them from time to time. Of course, NPCs can also be evil and part of the the bad guys team. Uh, And of course, the the most memorable one, or the one that that they are supposed to love to hate, kind of, is the the, the big bad evil, as they say, uh, the nemesis. And uh, I recently actually watched a video by once again the the great game master channel um which was about designing the ultimate big bad evil and uh, it had some wonderful advice on how to structure uh, such a such a an, an, an yeah an opposition or an enemy uh, in a way that um, yeah that can help you inform their decisions very very helpful Earlier on, I mentioned um, wandering around aimlessly. And one thing that you can do to avoid that happening is for the characters to have very clear goals to achieve. And very often this takes uh, the form of what's popularly known as a MacGuffin. So a thing that they need to find. And uh, in my case, the MacGuffin was broken into 13 pieces. So that gave me lots and lots of very clear goals to achieve. And every now and then they would find um, hints as to where the next piece might be and that um, you know that drove them in a certain direction and then getting there can be a whole quest on its own um, they had to cross different uh, continents and large oceans um, and there were all kinds of ways to do that but they, that, that gave adventure in itself um, but they constantly had a clear goal something to pursue something to do something to stop from happening something to make sure it happens Um, And and that makes for, I think, uh, exciting play and also easy prep. I mean, I I knew exactly what the characters wanted, so I could prepare that. And that's very handy for you as a game master. Then the uh, second to last bit that I think is crucial in a longer campaign is that you ask for feedback every now and then. So we had our session zero. We're a couple of weeks or a couple of months in. Uh, How do you feel about the campaign? Are you still happy with your character? Are you happy with where the story is headed? Are you happy with how we're running things? Are you happy with the atmosphere and those kind of elements and if the answers are all resounding yeses then you're on the right track but if somebody says well actually i'm so bored of my character now i you know i've been playing him for months and it just uh, doesn't really scratch my itch anymore um you know that that at least opens up the conversation like okay should we retire this character and somehow bring in a new one and what kind of character and why and what etc and um, and that happened uh, once in in my campaign um and um and that's fine by me. I mean, I, I, I originally had given that character quite an important role in the larger story, but that's okay. If, if the player doesn't want to play that character anymore, um, you should give them that space. And I did by um, kind of conniving with him to, uh, to kill his character in an episode. And, uh, well, it was shocking for the other players. They had no idea. And they're like, What? what happened? Oh my God. And um, yeah, that that made for a fun moment. And then of course we introduced his new character and they were like, oh, we see what's going on here. Um, And and that's wonderful. And it worked. It was no problem. Just as like with longer running series, TV series, uh, characters go and and new ones uh, appear and and that's no problem. Uh, As long as you have um, this robust framework for your story, the story itself shouldn't suffer too much from characters leaving or arriving. Um, And it also you have to make sure that you you don't make a particular character crucial to your story because that's problematic. It gives them plot armor once they find out. And this process of feedback can be very informal, just asking, hey guys, do you still like this? Um, uh, All the way up to uh, having it kind of mechanized. So certain role-playing games actually have this built in. Uh, I remember, for instance, uh, Index Card RPG 
um, has a section in the game mastering um, a chapter that sa- it calls it the tribunal, uh, something that you really should do at the end of your session where you're talking about the game but not playing the game. And you talk about all these aspects that I just mentioned. And there are other role-playing games that, that have kind of mechanized this and some even build in into that part of it um, how you earn experience points. And then the final ingredient to a long-running role-playing game campaign I think is an absolutely epic ending. Uh, the ending should be uh, mind-blowing in several ways and should really be a fitting ending to such a large investment in time and effort um, and should highlight all the cool stuff of the player characters and all the cool stuff of the story and one thing that i really loved doing was also bringing back some cameos kind of of um, npcs and and things uh, that they have or hadn't dealt with in the the long-running campaign so some of the b plots came to kind of chase them and say hey you forgot about me didn't you uh, and that was a lot of fun and uh, once again i i really have to show Shout out to the Great Game Master channel, which um, has an excellent video on ending campaigns where I got most of my ideas for this grand finale. And um, it, yeah, you should just watch it. It's great. So those are my conclusions. But now let's, let's see how the players experienced all this. Welcome to the show, Jorin, Mike, Marijn, Kirsten and Steyer. You are without a doubt RPG heroes after playing in my D&D campaign for nearly four years. Your creativity and spontaneity have turned uh, what could have been a a mediocre campaign into a truly epic one. Uh, All the shenanigans between the characters and all the interesting developments around uh, different characters have given me a lot of pleasure in in preparing for for each uh, session. And of course, you are very patient because four years is a very long time. Um, so yeah, welcome to the show. Thank and, you very much. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, this is the first time I'm interviewing five people at the same time. So listeners, if it gets a bit chaotic, well, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, so before we, uh, before we uh, completely dive in here into the, the content, um, <clears throat> let's just um, start off with a question. That, um, that I'm actually curious about, which is what made you decide to join this campaign? So why, why did you decide, hey, let's, let's trust this weirdo from Groningen uh, to, to run a good game for us? Um, I think I can, uh, can best start one here. Sure, okay. I, I was the one to originally see your message on Facebook, mm-hmm. which was a call to action from a certain dungeon master who had recently moved to our lovely city and was looking for players for an RPG. And since I was desperate for some D&D or some Pathfinder, I reached out. And I involved two of the other players as well in that uh, reaching out. Yeah, excellent. Um, okay. And, and what, about, uh, what about you, Stai? So you heard about this? Uh, yeah, well, ha- having the same last name as you made me trust you instantly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but besides that, I, uh, yeah, I had a lot of very short campaigns, not even complete campaigns. They're always just difficulties getting the crew together, Mm -hmm. um, having fun interaction with other (laughs) other players, and maybe also having different views of what we're we're going to do. Mm, Um, So uh, yeah, lots of short-lived campaigns. And I I thought this guy, he has something going on. (laughs) He might know what he's doing, yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Um, and um, so what about you, Kirsten? So you joined us as well. And that, if I'm not mistaken, this was your first uh, D&D campaign, right? Yes, in fact, it was. Um, I had very little experience with role playing uh, when we started because I just recently started uh, a Pathfinder campaign uh, together with Mike, actually. But that was uh, a campaign that was led by a GM that um, yeah didn't prepare the sessions that well so both Mike and I weren't really satisfied with that game and therefore we decided uh, yeah that we wanted to stop that and then Mike brought me into contact with you yeah (laughs) so it started excellent all right great and then so what we did is we met up in a in a bar a lovely bar in the city center for uh, what a lot of people would call a session zero so we discussed the parameters for the campaign 
Um, and I'm curious what your expectations were after that meeting. Um, let's see. So not all of you were there. Um, so let's, let's go to Kirsten since you were just talking. So yeah, you met us for the first time. Um, what were your expectations after that session zero? Um, yeah, that, that's a good question because I had so little experience in D&D. &D. I was just very confused after the first <laughs> session. <laughs> <at the end. laughs> I didn't know what to expect at all. Oh, but right. I liked the meeting and I had the idea that we were with a group of nice people. So yeah. I just let it come to me. Yeah, yeah. So your expectations were basically, well, they seem like decent people. I guess we can have fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, and why not? Uh, but Staya, you mentioned more specifically that you hey, you have some experience and you you were hoping for something different. Um, so, how what were your expectations after that session zero? Well, the fact that we even did a session zero, this was new to me. Usually, ah. oh, create your character, let's get together and play. Uh, yeah. And now it was really let's talk about what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. What do you want for your character? Do you want lots of combat? Do you want lots uh, of playing your character, uh, yeah, rolling dice for us, play, rolling, uh, playing, a, playing a role. Uh -huh. um, so that was, that was interesting. It was a more serious approach to getting started. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, that was enough for me, yeah. Okay. And, and, and so what were your expectations after that? So um, what, what kind of game did you think you were going to get into? Ah, yeah, well, a, a balanced game, role-playing and combat. Mm -hmm. um, character development was really important. Yeah. Uh, having uh, a large overall story arc combined with smaller stories, mm -hmm. small adventures, maybe smaller adventures for the single character. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, that was going to be my follow-up question. So, sorry. <laughs> no, I rushed ahead. Sorry, <laughs> that's perfectly fine. And I think Mike was trying to say something as well there. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. Uh, you, you sent us some questions before the session zero, which is, was mm -hmm. already a great sign. And then, um, well, we prepared some answers to bring to the session, but you also anticipated some of our questions for during session zero as well, which were all just good signs. Uh, on my end, so my, mm. my expectations were very high at the end of session zero because oh dear. <laughs> basically you, you tick every box uh, for 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 good expectations. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And and so how did these expectations work out for you? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Uh, as as I already highlighted, you you seek a lot of balance in the games. So basically, what what you saw was on was a, a traditional D and D experience, essentially with like yeah. an overarching campaign, important backstories, uh, etc. Yeah. I think you uh, you definitely uh, met those expectations. Great. Well, that's good to know. Thanks. Um, yeah, and then since we're talking about characters and character development, um, you all had very interesting characters that that were, uh, I think, a joy to work with um, when it came to coming up with all kinds of ways to, you know, mess you up. <laughs> um, so, I just uh, if if each of you could just very briefly. Um, say something about your character that you played um, in some cases characters uh, but let's uh, let's find out what, how, what exactly happened um, and then tell us how did that character evolve did they change at all or did they grow or uh, that kind of stuff and, and yeah did you like that um, let's start with uh, Marijn because stuff happened with your character <laughs> definitely stuff happened with my character yeah <laughs> So um, this was also my, my very first D&D experience. I've always wanted to, be able to play the game, but I never really managed to make it work. Mm. Um, so I came in it with a completely fresh, uh, fresh slate. Um, at least, uh, luckily, I had somebody who was able to guide me through the process of making an interesting character, at least uh, from a uh, uh, theory uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided after a little bit of a talk to, to make a wizard um, who's... Um, uh, Basically, this, this brilliant uh, guy had his art, yet has suffered some catastrophic accident with one of his apprentices in the past, which has sort of tempered his dependence on magic and sort of uh, put things into perspective and then started traveling the world and encountered a random group of adventurers, which is the party. Yeah. And they say, um, you look like a trustworthy fellow. <laughs> exactly. So he's basically basically intended to be 
an easy character to start playing D&D with as well. So uh, yeah. kind of a, 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 a blank slate uh, personality, not really fleshed out because, well, I wouldn't really know how to push it one way or the other either way. So just figuring mm. out during the sessions where things went. And yeah. turns out he's a bit of an asshole. He <laughs> turns out he does think like he's uh, uh, better than everybody else. Uh, uh, but that, that did um, cause some, uh, some interesting interactions within the party. So I'm really happy uh, yeah. that that happened and uh, uh, fit, fit nicely within the group, um, which works up wide, right, uh, quite well until he met his unfortunate demise mm. when he was vaporized by a lightning breath weapon of uh, a dragon that you sent after us. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, in the way that that went... Um, it's actually naturally made sense for uh, that character to be replaced by this apprentice who had, uh -huh. yes. um, had that accident. So the reason that the apprentice had that um, uh, accident was because he was uh, absolutely obsessed with using magic as, uh, as a source of power and to gain power. Hmm. So I went from this, this character who was kind of well-rounded in uh, as a party member and um, uh, made some good decisions into an absolutely mag ma uh, magical fanatic yeah. who had uh, um, turned yeah to some very unfortunate forces in order to make up for some uh, <laughs> limitations that uh, that he had as a person yeah exactly and so i find it very interesting that your second character ever uh, turns out to be evil um <clears throat> and so this is a thing that a lot of people advise against uh, when when you you watch YouTube videos or read blogs about D and D. So never never have an evil character in the party. It's terrible. Well, we had fun with it. Um, we we did talk a bit about it beforehand to say, hey, uh, how evil exactly is this going to be? Uh, how can we do it in a way that it's fun for everybody? Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think you did a, an excellent job. And um, so did that character, was he um, like very one-sided or did he change throughout the, the rest of the campaign? So there's definitely an, an interesting development there. So it is definitely, as you said, so when I was looking around at it, um, I also, first of all, want, wondered whether I would want to play an evil character at all. Hmm. Um, but just when I went into it, I started finding, figuring out ways which I would think it would fit well within the party. Yeah. Um, like you, you, you don't want a party member who's actually trying to counteract what the party's doing. Yeah. Um, that doesn't really push, uh, uh, then, then the system doesn't really work as a storytelling experience anymore because yeah. you have all this infighting going on. So there needs to be a reason for my character to still have the same goals as the party. Yeah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the motivations need to be the same. Exactly. Yeah. So um, uh, basically, that's, that's fundamentally where I put it. Uh, the character still needed to do the right things for the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and secondly, also building in a bit of a fail-safe where my um, character is actually uh, worshipping um, an evil god, which is definitely within your control as a dungeon master. Yep. So if Hados ever went, goes off the rails and does something that you don't approve, uh, he can simply get a message from... <laughs> Yeah, the goal to stop doing that and go do something else. Yeah, yeah, that was very handy. I agree. Yeah, so yeah. that 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 does definitely help to to uh, to uh, to go there. But the, really, the interesting uh, duality of that situation is is as as the party. Do you trust a party member that is clearly yeah. does not have the same values and clearly does not have the same motivations. Yeah, and that um, detects as evil. <laughs> exactly, detects yeah. as evil as far as the system goes, but yeah. is doing the right things. How do you deal something with that? Yeah. And that's yeah. also the interesting part that I found that was to be developed here, because in the end, yeah. the answer to that was, well, yes, up to a certain point. Yeah. Um, like at one point, the, group, the, the party started actively plotting to kill him. Yeah. Never never got to that point um no, and it's kind no. of interesting to see where that ended up as well where um because i didn't wasn't sure where it was going to go whether he was just going to be like murdered in his sleep one day which i would have been totally fine with as well there was plenty of reasons to do that yeah, yeah. so um or if the um uh it would come down to something like what it was where the party was basically trying to 
get him to change his ways and yeah improve his morals which he almost did well <laughs> <laughs> it didn't really turn out well for him in the end but no. <laughs> it was yeah. a valiant effort by the party absolutely yeah um and uh, so the, um, yeah, so you had one character death and you played two characters. Uh, Mike actually played uh, three characters, right? That's right. That's right. Um, first off was a, uh, the character I played the longest, I think uh, over two years. It was a large prototype warforged warrior called Talos, uh, who discovered he may have been created for a very different purpose than he was initially led to believe. And uh, despite the lack of a soul, was being guided by the goddess Dora. Um, unfortunately, after playing about half the campaign with uh, Talos, I kind of grew tired of the character. Because for those of you who don't know, 3.5 does not have the most interesting fighter class. So after about two years, I was kind of done with him, being able not, not being able to grow him into anything. So I, with uh, the DM's permission, I asked to uh, retire him. Um, I think do think he had a, a satisfying arc, but it just was cut short. And yeah. I can definitely tell by by certain events during the last session that you had uh, big plans for him, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which was interesting. Yeah. Um, next up was the proud capsule diplomat uh, called Razar, who uh, on his very first diplomatic mission was captured and enslaved for ten years to fight in an arena. And it was basically his goal uh, to bring trade and more modern ideas and concepts to his rather uh, xenophobic and backward people, um, which he kind of uh, succeeded in, at least with the dwarves, where he uh, in the Moor Holds, where he eventually got some diplomatic uh, traction. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, at uh, some point uh, during the campaign, as I had already built him as a very noble and self-sacrificing character. At some point, a decision had to be made to sacrifice an innocent person, and he could not allow that to happen. So instead, he, instead he sacrificed himself instead of that unknown innocent person. Yeah. And that unknown innocent person became my third character, the Cobalt War Mage Sixalius, uh, who was more of a chaotic destructive force who simply fought for his tribe um, using his devastating magic, but who by happenstance was convinced by a deity, technically a Kuatl dragon uh, from the Eberron setting, to change his ways and to use this destructive forces at his command for a more noble cause, rather than just conquest and destroying the enemies of his tribe. And that was a really fun and interesting character, but sadly I could only play him for a few sessions before uh, the campaign ended. Yeah. <laughs> which was a shame because I do think that was a very fun character to play. Yeah. Uh, I think he was also the first who detected uh, Marijn's character as evil, yeah. Uh, yeah. which gave you a, a conundrum to, to, to deal with. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 he was a war mage a hybrid uh, with Rainbow Servant, and Rainbow Servant is a prestige class that gets detect alignment or detect evil as an at will ability. Yeah. And nobody else had that ability or spell at any point during the game because we didn't have like clerics or paladins with us at any point. Mm -hmm. um, so during over, I believe, breakfast, he decided yeah. to like, oh, just scan the party. Who's evil? Oh, hey, you're evil. <laughs> Let's not help yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that, okay. that definitely kicked off a lot of distrust <laughs> that um, remained for quite a few sessions. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Until the kind of the final session where there was an yeah. uneasy alliance. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Um, Jorin, what about you? So you, you joined us um, a, a little bit later in the campaign. Um, mm -hmm. What can you tell us about your character? Well, I uh, played my Dwarven Druid Thoric. Um, he was meant as a very stoic and a bit silent uh, type character where I run into the problem that I am not, and that's really hard to play. Yeah. <laughs> if you're not. <laughs> um, but I had a lot of fun with him. Uh, he was just, he stayed very the same, I think. He stayed very similar throughout the uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. He opened more, more up to the party, but less of a character arc in terms of personality, I think. 
so yeah, as he started out as a simple druid, not too much uh, hullabaloo, and then as time went on, he got more powerful, and then we landed in the Murholds, where uh, I got a dragon mark, yeah. just like that, and I think that shift in power and shift in status all of a sudden for him was a very big change, because mm, yeah. he started out with, you know, I don't want status and I don't want money, and now I suddenly have this thrown upon me, and I have to do something with it. Yeah. And um, I, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. Because with great power comes, well, we all know the phrase, great responsibility. Huh? <laughs> yeah. That's how Warwick became Spider-Man. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kirsten, what about you? What about your character? Because that character went through some changes. Yes, um, well, I started with this um, male elf, uh, Liari, who was quite frustrated with his mother, who had treasoned him because he left the entire family um, to go off with some orc. Mm. Um, so uh, Liari joined the party actually to, um, yeah, partly to hunt his mother and this orc down um, because he uh, actually wanted to kill him. <laughs> Yeah. But the uh, fun thing is that we ended up um, partying, uh, yeah, joining the party with, uh, with my mother and the orc uh, and actually went on uh, some quests together. Mm -hmm. um, so we became, yeah, I won't say friendly, but uh, we worked together. Um, a very interesting change my character had is that in the same um, encounter with uh, the dragon that Marijn already mentioned, mm -hmm. um, Liari got badly hurt. Um, and actually, when he wake up, uh, he was changed quite a lot. He um, was no longer a he, <laughs> for yeah. starters. He turned into a female drow. And uh, that was challenging because, uh, yeah, then was uh, a problem at once. Um, yeah, being a, a drow was not accepted everywhere we went. So mm -hmm. I uh, remember having to enter cities uh, dressed like uh, a mummy yeah. <laughs> yeah. to prevent people from seeing that I was actually a drow. Mm -hmm. um, and as if that wasn't bad enough, um, I appeared to uh, have switched bodies with some uh, famous drow, <laughs> uh, some kind of seer. Uh -huh. And we met uh, the drow when we were um, below uh, the ground. Mm -hmm. um, and there I was recognized by a high-positioned other drow who was badly in love with me. Yep. So <laughs> she wanted me to come back to uh, the, <laughs> to the uh, yeah, where, where the drow were from. Yeah. Um, but we ended up, uh, yeah using her a bit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to help us out till yeah until the very end almost um a few sessions before the finale we left her for death yeah <laughs> which Harsh. was not appreciated <laughs> at all because she came she came back to hunt us down <laughs> yeah she so, was very angry yeah yeah she was <laughs> <laughs> excellent yeah so um, yeah, this being your, your first game of uh, Dungeons and Dragons, um, did you expect anything like that at all? Or No, I was really surprised by this. <laughs> mm, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so, so obviously those kind of changes to your character, um, yeah, some people could experience that as uh, yeah, the, like unpleasant, like, hey, you're changing aspects of my character that I didn't design. Um, <clears throat> How was that for you? Did, like, was it annoying when it happened or were you okay with it? I loved it mm. because I ended up, uh, because it was my first character I developed, I uh, went for a very safe character, I think, uh -huh. uh, yeah. Elf Ranger. Uh -huh. And this was really something interesting, which I had to deal with. Yeah. So, yeah, I really liked it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of a problem you cannot uh, solve with a bow and arrow or a sword. Huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's also, just looking at the situation from, from outside of mm. uh, it directly, I really found it a interesting solution because you have this character who's really badly wounded, pretty much dead. And mm. 
you don't necessarily want as a GM to, you know, take their character away from them completely, but there should definitely be consequences to yeah. having your uh, character uh, um, pass on the, on the battlefield. Yeah. So it's really interesting to see that there is also these solutions to uh, uh, still be able to uh, save some aspects of the character yeah. without... Uh, immediately uh, um, just having a mag magically resurrect or something like that. Uh, yeah. There's real consequences to that. And just being able to, you know, navigate those is, uh, uh, it, it really does um, make it possible to keep playing a character without having this sort of character immunity, which is always yeah. a bit of a risk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I, I didn't want to um, yeah, create that feeling like, oh, we have plot armor, we don't have to worry about anything. Uh. <laughs> we were truly shocked when it happened. <laughs> when when uh, Marijn's first character got burned to death, he was yeah. just ashes. Yep. It, we it were, was also like, the same beam of lightning. It yeah, was yeah, yeah. everyone just in one go. Yeah, yeah. It was perfectly just... in one line. I was like, wow, this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think oh. all of us said, holy... Yeah. I can't mention the word here, but holy <laughs> man. Yeah, 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 we were definitely <laughs> shocked by that lightning breath weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, I'm just I'm so sorry. glad that I <laughs> survived that because I was at the end yeah. of that horrible line. Mm, and yeah. somehow I still stood there at like 10 hit points or something. It was yeah, like, yeah. help. <laughs> yeah, that was just, a great moment. Yeah. It was amazing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Staya, so last but not least, your, your character um, also made it all the way to the end. Um, can you tell us a bit about the mysterious Dex or whatever yeah, his name well, was? <laughs> um, I had trouble deciding what I wanted to play. And then I found uh, uh, the changeling race. And I was unfamiliar with it, but decided, okay, as a changeling, I can be all kinds of races, not necessarily have their abilities, mm -hmm. but... I can be, uh, and it turned out I was a hobgoblin called Kalat, yeah. a dwarf called Bergroom, a human called Piotr, an elf called Dalin, and a half orc called Timok. Yeah. Um, so that was interesting for me to try out all these different flavors, all these personas. Um, and my character evolution, well, I went from not trusting anyone because I didn't want to show my real self, my changeling looks. Yeah slightly cha changing towards uh, trusting the other players or the other characters, I should say. Yeah. Um, I went from not trusting any magics because magic could, of course, reveal your true persona uh, to slightly trusting <laughs> wizards. <laughs> not all of them. <laughs> Some of them. One notable exception. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, from the start of the game, I had no religion. And um, during the game, one of the first sessions, I believe, I made a sacrifice to apparently an evil god, <laughs> yeah. uh, which had severe consequences for me during the game. Uh, the, the evil deity got a hold of me and tried to control me. So for the personal development, there was uh, lots, lots of things going on there. Mm. Uh, in the end, I did find a true God, a, a, a good God that helped me. Uh, so yeah, lots of different things for me to try, lots Ooh. of character development. Yeah. Uh, I loved it. Yeah, great. Yeah. And of course, the, 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 the evil character of Marijn trying to persuade you to join. The <laughs> the yeah, I'm actually quite a curious about that because during one of the more notable um, uh, like sort of informal RP sessions uh, between the sessions. Uh, uh, my character did try to uh, convince our changeling to join the dark side as per se. Yep. I've, uh, I've actually, I haven't asked you this, but I'm wondering how much of that's what was going on while he was trying to basically in, uh, initiate you as an agent of shadow. Um, how much of that was you actually being interested in this as an option and how much was this your character just playing along trying to get information out of mine it was 50 50 uh, as you know I, I i made a challenge to the evil deity to the shadow saying talk to me tell me what you want uh but and, and we might work together but it will be uh the way i want it to be not in any other way uh, so, yeah, there was definitely temptation uh, and I loved it, but 
uh, at the same time, my character was good at heart and he always knew this is an evil deity. Yeah. Uh, so I also had to string you along a bit, uh, saying what you wanted to hear maybe. Uh, we had a great Discord running separate from you, <laughs> yeah. uh, from you, Marijn, uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. to discuss Operation Downfall, <laughs> um, which meant if at a certain point you crossed a certain line that we would have to kill you. <laughs> yep. That was so funny. When I got invited to that, I'm like, what is going on? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's one interesting story there that we, uh, Marijn's character uh, has great power uh, and he did a lot of teleporting stuff, which was really strong and powerful in the game. So we decided we wanted to limit this power of teleportation. You know, we were after certain artifacts. Uh, and when we got on, a, we had plans to get on a train. And I had infiltrated, as a changeling, of course, the train company. And then um, I made sure everyone was on the list to get on the train, except for Marijn's character. <laughs> uh, and then I decided, okay, if Marijn comes up to the train, I will tell him, you're not on the list. They made you. Uh, but teleport in, okay? So we made sure you would have to use one of your daily teleports to get on the train. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, that was lots of fun, fun plotting against you uh, and keeping a straight face. The moment I figured out that you had this like ongoing plot to yeah. basically keep like this character under control and <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, that, really, uh, really cool. Yeah. And I think that, that that's a, a great way to deal with finding out, oh, we have an evil character among us uh, instead of just confronting them or killing them or doing some sort of... Uh, intervention we all love you <laughs> um you know you you basically yeah, you you try to subtly keep him under control and keep him within arm's length yeah <clears throat> i mean not so subtly at some point yeah. like i saw some of the things that they had discussed so yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, at one point they got some npcs and say go that way look out for the wizard with one arm he's very dangerous if he's doing nothing leave him be otherwise take him down <laughs> They're just sending NPCs towards me too. <laughs> that was one of my personas again. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what, one thing that that uh, affected our campaign is that um, at some point, due to the COVID nineteen uh, crisis, uh, we had to switch from gaming at the dinner table to uh, playing online. Um, I'm curious how that affected the campaign for you guys. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question. So um, when it comes to dealing with, uh, with those, uh, these kinds of, of, of fixed party games, uh, could be of any sort, it could be Dungeons and Dragons or other meets, uh, there will always be situations in real life that throw a wrench in your plans. Yeah. And I think it's just the core of it is having just a healthy mindset to deal with adversity and just make the best of it. Um, it could be that, you know, one of the party members is, has things in real life that make it hard for this person to actually join physically, or it might be global pandemic. Yeah. Um, but either way, you just, you know, you grab what you can get and you just keep going. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily all have to be bad. There's, it's a new situation, but also makes a couple of new things possible that weren't before. Yeah. Um, like what we were talking about before, where we have this this um, uh, uh, this one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation between the characters outside of the session that wouldn't have happened, I think, if we had only played like face-to-face. Uh, -face. Yeah. So because we were online, it was easier to start role-playing outside of the sessions as well, which yeah. got a little we... bit more... Uh, um, yeah, a little bit more like um, character depth out of that as well, which is which yeah. is also a good thing. Yeah. Um, so in the end, for me, it didn't really hurt at okay. all. Um, it's uh, it's just as, you, as long as you have the mindset to really go past it and to say, okay, let's just still have fun. Let's just do something awesome. Then you can make it work. Yeah. It maybe yeah. helped that we played for a long time before Corona times hit us. Yeah. And we all knew each other. Um, that definitely helped a bit. Yeah. So we're not strangers kind of thinking, no, okay, I guess we're going to, yeah. Sorry, That's go true. ahead. I just want to say, I 
don't enjoy it much less because I get distracted mm. by everything that's on my screen as well and I yeah. start doing other things and and that's much less so at the table. Mm. And I also just prefer that because it's don't know, it has a nicer feeling for me. And yeah. I, I agree with your point of like, yeah, it gives different kind of role play. Mm-hmm. But um out of out of session role play can still happen when you play at a dinner table. Yeah, yeah. Then you just talk with other people online still online probably but mm-hmm. it's it's a bit yeah yeah it does some things are easier because there are things like foundry and roll 20 which just teach you how to do things mm-hmm. that that's much easier but yeah, yeah i i 100 prefer playing at a table yeah i have to agree with that i, I also prefer it but uh, for some things for instance you right, right around the time that we had to switch to online when we started using roll 20 um, you were also going into this yeah, mega dungeon kind of place. And to be honest, that was easier on Roll20 for me. Okay. Uh, it takes a bit of time to prepare, but then once it's there, you know, you can move the tokens around, you get your dynamic lighting and your sound effects and all these things set up. And then, yeah, it's easier than trying to um, have such a large map on a dinner table. <clears throat> that, was, that was such a massive map. Even in Roll20, you had to cut it up in like six, yeah, six maps. Yeah, six yeah maps, that, uh, that, that place was insane. Yeah. yeah, it was really cool, but I, I don't see how you could have possibly done that on the dinner table. <laughs> no. No, but I for agree. example, what you did when uh, during the session with the, the, the Blue Dragon that we mm-hmm. already talked about, yeah. uh, we were on that airship. Mm-hmm. You just kept grabbing new papers and just drawing new uh, like routes through the canyon that we were going through. And I thought yeah. that was really nice because, you know, we could still see it yeah. and just, you know, new papers every single time. And I was yeah. like, yeah, that, that works too. And it's... yeah. It was sure. kind of like a, like a side-scroller, really nice. you know, like the really yeah. old uh, computer games, yeah. <laughs> and what I really liked about the online, uh, the World 20 setting, was that when we had a party split, um, your side had only your side. So um, if uh, Marijn was somewhere else, you didn't have a clue. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's true. Something yeah. you cannot do on the dinner table. Yeah. Still, I like dinner table better, but this was something I really liked in Roll20. Yeah, absolutely. When you have a split party, yeah, then it, especially when you use things like dynamic lighting and things, and yeah, it, it gets very tense. Um, and I, I intend to use that uh, to maximum uh, effect also, in especially in horror games. Um, I, there's a different group <laughs> that I play Call of Cthulhu with, and uh, it's just absolutely perfect for that. You know, this this feeling of isolation, like you're really on your own because the rest of the map is just black. You don't see anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and it was also different, interesting with the, the whole dynamic uh, lighting uh, feature of these online tools as well, is that... Um, uh, these abilities like uh, dark vision and low light vision actually start really mattering because yeah. I was starting to hear like some combat conversation between my party members talking about what was coming towards us. Yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. looking at my screen and I just don't see it. And it's, <laughs> it, it instills that, that sort of, yeah. that's that dread that yeah. you have to use something to get some light going. Otherwise you have, you can't contribute. Yeah, especially as a spellcaster, you need to see something to do. Something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah per- personally, I'm very much a visually oriented person. So mm-hmm. when you introduce an NPC, having like a, uh, in Roll20, for example, they call the handout mm-hmm. to show the NPC and actually have a token for the NPC ready. Yeah. To me, is very important because I really like that. I really connect with that. Yeah. And um, Roll20 just makes that, and similar programs, make it very easy to uh, introduce certain visual elements and Really yeah. suck me. It really helps to suck me into the world uh, and the, the uh, or, the, or the battle map that we're playing on. Yeah. And as as Marijn pointed out, uh, dynamic lighting, uh, roll twenty feature is is great for this. Uh, I also run a Pathfinder campaign myself as a dungeon master. Uh, I use dynamic lighting in a prison to great effect as well. Mm. Uh, it it really adds a lot, I think. Yeah. Um, that being said, as Jorin pointed out, it can be quite distracting. You definitely yeah. have to teach yourself not to open up a web browser or do something else if, if you're not involved in the role play currently going on, for example. Mm-hmm. That's just something you have to teach yourself. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, I do prefer sitting around the dinner table with my friends um, because, you know, it's, it's always better to, to make eye contact directly with someone when role playing yeah. than just hearing a voice or seeing someone through a webcam. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not the same. Uh, I like both versions of the ways to play the game but if i had to choose one i would have to choose the dinner table yeah 
Yeah, and some people combined the two, the two, right? I remember Kirsten showing us a picture of uh, the dinner table, I think, uh, at, at her house where somebody had brought a huge television and put it flat on the, yeah. on the table yeah, and put their Roll20 stuff on there. Yeah, why not? Yeah, that's a, that's a very cool idea. And there was um, one more advantage maybe for the, the online gameplay is that we could send you, you our DM, personal messages yeah. saying to the group one thing and then... Uh-huh. Saying to you, oh no, we're doing something else. Yeah. Without also <laughs> looking too disinter- yeah. without looking too disinterested because we're on our phone, you know, at the at the table. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the yeah. other players, Marijn in this case, would not know what was happening. Yeah. 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 And I have to say, as a game master, that that can get a bit overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> definitely. You didn't make things too easy. Yeah. yeah. The that five people definitely. sending you direct messages, like, oh, mm-hmm. I'm also narrating something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so the campaign took longer than I had anticipated, uh, almost four years. Um, what would, what would you say is the ideal length of a campaign? Like, was this too long or was it too short or? Uh, personally, I definitely prefer longer campaigns like the one we just wrapped up because mm-hmm. it gives characters, um, more time to grow and develop and really have like a, an arc. And uh, for me personally, it lets me have a real connection to the world that the campaign takes place in. Because yeah. if I know beforehand that a campaign is like three to eight sessions long, then it's difficult to really care what happens to an NPC or a, a village being besieged, yeah. knowing that in just a few months' time, it doesn't matter because we'll be on to something new. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, what about you, Kirsten? Yeah, I think I uh, prefer a long campaign as well because, uh, yeah, what Mike already said, you become attached to your character and uh, the other characters. And if you have a very short campaign, then I think you would miss that aspect. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. Hey, and I'm um, uh, uh, curious about um, the most memorable moment uh, from the campaign. So we, we played for four years, so there's a lot of moments, a lot of things happened. We've already heard some, uh, some pretty shocking things, <laughs> um, literally and figuratively speaking. Um, so let's uh, kick this one off with, uh, with Staya. Um, what was the most memorable thing that happened in the game for you? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so many things. Like... Uh, I made a character who would escape and bluff his way out of every possible situation. And that's exactly what happened n- numerous times. Like, mm. uh, and he had so much fun bluffing his way out and then rolling the D20 and hitting that perfect 20. And then <laughs> uh, we just laugh out loud. Um, also uh, talking about uh, getting attached to characters, I got attached to my character, but also got attached to the other player's characters. Yeah, And I was completely surprised when Mike's character more or less sacrificed himself. And I was, I was stunned. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and I really felt like, um, you know, the, the, the sessions afterwards, I missed the, the Talos character. I missed him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I th- it felt like a loss. And this is something you can only do in a long campaign. And, yeah, true. Uh, yeah, we had so many, so many great moments. Maybe one of the highlights was uh, finding the solution to a complex puzzle, like, ah, uh, I, I figured it out. Yeah, that yeah. That was really great. I think I had to turn a piece in a wall uh-huh. uh, and then uh, oh, something yeah. opened up, the, the eye of Ra. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that that's was, cool. Yeah. So many. I can't choose, man. Sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. What about you, uh, Jorin? Well, um, the the moment I joined the campaign, I uh, was just you know told like yeah no you're walking through the desert and you see like a falling star and you know this is important and I was just you know still hoarding all my stuff and uh, I just got on a cool prophecy from you and it was like the fourth line or something was uh, falling stars and I was like oh no here we go and yep. that was just epic and. I also loved, um, like I said, when I got that dragon mark and mm. suddenly it turned out that I was in fact the heir to the throne. Yeah. And I just said, no, yeah. I'm going to take it from you. And now you can have it back. But I do want your help and your inform- information. And, but I don't want it. Yeah. yeah I, I'm a... taking it from you right now. Here you have it back. Cause, yeah. And that just, yeah. And, and the same, that same line also, that white dragon was... Insane. 
yeah. that was also very epic because and just a lot of fun with with Hoddle's very that was very for, for me like that was actually oh this is what he can do this is what our new wizard can do yeah uh, with the moment of you know yeah no we're casting a spell on him and uh, on, on, on the dragon and mm. now we're both falling to the ground like plummeting uh-huh. and people just asking yeah but what are you gonna do how are you gonna fix this yeah. and then he being yeah teleporting to the ground now done and i just said no yeah i, I withdrew it i turned into a bird we're done yeah. no consequences because of all the bullshit you get to pull as as a magic character in 3.5 yeah it's, yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it gets a bit nuts after a while yeah <laughs> after a while yeah i held i held back a lot too after yeah. after a while because yeah you have to absolutely yeah yeah um okay and uh what about uh what about kirsten what was your most memorable moment in the in the whole campaign i think for me it's it was also puzzles there were a lot a lot of puzzles mm-hmm. and one moment I really enjoyed, uh, it was before the COVID uh, period, so we were at the dinner table still. Yeah. And then there was this, um, this, this hall we were in where there were pillars and we had to turn them into the right position so they would reflect rays of light to a certain point. Oh, yeah. And then you had this on the table with pieces of rope yeah. so we could actually turn pillars and position the ray, rays of light and that was just so much fun yeah even though the concept is really simple it's like a typical mm-hmm. tomb raider kind of thing but yeah making it physical that yeah i agree yeah. And, and that's something you you can make it look really cool in roll 20 but it's not the same yeah and it's yeah, the it's same with, with the tablet pieces you you just oh, yeah. constructed them so we had them physically yeah True, yeah. Oh yeah, that's that's worth highlighting. Our dungeon master actually created the pieces that we had together for the uh, end of the campaign. He created from what was it, styrofoam or? Yeah, foam foam core. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was that was incredible. Like painted and carved and then cut into pieces. Mm-hmm. Those were the actual shards of the tablet we had together, which was uh, a lot of effort and it looked beautiful. I still want them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think we all secretly do, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would, well, I would definitely uh, like to have a piece just to just to keep as a as a as a token. Oh, absolutely, if, yeah. If you're willing no. to uh, to part with them. Yeah, I'm done with them, so <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, absolutely, yeah, cool, yeah, no, and, and that's one of those things, yeah. The, every now and then, if you make something physical for uh, like a prop for the game, it yeah, that can really elevate the uh, the atmosphere. Yeah, so I'm glad you guys uh, appreciated that. that that's yeah, awesome. yeah, that was great. I also remember one time I got a, a small note from you mm. saying something about a dream or something, and uh-huh. then I knew this was in the old start of the campaign somewhere. I got a, just a little note saying mm. you had a really bad dream. Yeah. It felt re- real, and I knew. Oh man, stuff is going down. I still yeah. have that note. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. 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 And it's again that, that, that the, I can send you a, a message on the discord or whatever. And that's also interesting, but handing a note, it feels like you're at school kind of, you know, <laughs> Oh, like, secret just for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It just has that effect. Yeah. I, I also had uh, a favorite moment, um, mm-hmm. a, a technically two, but the first one, um, involves rolling a natural one that resulted in a death of two player characters. Oh, so yeah. I'd rather not go into that one. <laughs> 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 but uh, what, there, there's a second moment uh, at the start, near the start of the campaign. This was before uh, Yorin joined us. Um, mm. We, let's see what I had written down here. Um, right, the four of us were pinned down on a, sto- a tall stone column surrounded by a flowing lava. And we were pinned down by some hobgoblins on one of the the, uh, the banks of the Slava River. And we couldn't re- fall back either because I believe we broke the bridges behind us or something. And these hobgoblins actually had us pinned down, these archers. And they demanded that we hand over one of the quest items, one of the tablet uh, pieces. Yeah. And uh, I believe our wizards, Marijn, came up with uh, a beautiful solution to it, which is having my character copy one of the tablet pieces because scribing was one of my uh, my, my skills mm-hmm. and then uh, using uh, Unseen Servant 
I believe, no tensors floating discs or something yeah. to bring the table of pieces to the hobgoblins and then have his invisible floating servants or his, uh, what's it called? Yeah, the, the in, 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 what's it called? Unseen servants. Unseen servants, yeah. servants yeah, yeah. to have the tablet piece uh, <laughs> push it off gently, make it look like an accident, and have it tip into the lava. Yeah. Because we, we, could, we, could, we could spare to miss it because we had a copy. Yeah. And that demoralized the hobgoblins and they just retreated. And yeah. that way we, we had all the time we needed to get across. It was typically it was also one of those moments. Of, very tense situation. Absolutely. It was great teamwork and also one of those moments where you're as a game master, you're like, oh, Okay, <laughs> that just happened. <laughs> that, was, that was brilliant. I love that moment so much. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, actually that was the first session that I did of D and D ever. Oh, yeah, that, was oh, first yeah. Uh, yeah. that really was an awesome moment. I was yeah. really had, glad to be part of it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was cool. Um, and then we go to the ending. Um, so the the ending of the campaign, I I I pushed that forward a lot um, because I kept thinking, yeah, uh, I want to make it good and, and want to make it work and um at the same time i also wanted it to happen like it, i enjoyed the campaign but after four years you also you feel like maybe we should wrap it up and you know uh move on um so i'm very curious what you thought of the ending because we didn't have a lot of time afterwards to uh to chat about it because it was late at night and well uh on a sunday <clears throat> um yeah so what did what did you guys how did you experience the ending? What is, what was an important aspect of the ending that worked or didn't work? I did not sleep that night, basically. Oh, it was just still going on in my head, and just also the gruesome end of Hados as an evil character at that point. Just, which yeah. is also just a major highlight of of the whole experience. <laughs> that image of him reaching through a portal, shouting, that's. He uh, did everything that was ever asked of him as he's being torn apart by the very gold that he serves. Yeah. Um, just that whole image made it so epic mm. that, um, yeah, it definitely yeah, was a, uh, a conclusion that lived up to the, uh, the campaign as a whole. Excellent. Cool. Um, what about you, Kirsten? Yeah, it was a great last session, I would say. Um, we had, uh, of course, uh, what I talked about earlier, um, my, uh, yeah, not lover, but uh, <laughs> the other drow uh, uh -huh. coming back uh, absolutely furious because we left her um, <laughs> on a dragon. Yep. So first we had to uh, fight off, uh, I think, three dragons at once. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing m uh, that, that more dragons were uh, about to arrive. And then, uh, just in time, we, we went through a portal and ended up in space, <laughs> yeah. uh, where we had a, yeah, a very cool last battle with a claw <laughs> coming from the shadows. Yeah, uh, yeah it, was, it, it was amazing. Okay, awesome. Um, what about Jorin? How did you experience the ending? Yeah. Um, well, I, I loved it. It was uh, just really epic and very fun. That puzzle at the end was really fun. The the fact that we have to had to in space go to the different asteroids and pick stuff up and find the the runes there. And mm -hmm. yeah, those dragons. That was really awesome because we well had to fight them off and and the, the, but really also the fact that you gave us like cool powers for mm -hmm. the last session yeah. that made my day and the fact that I, I shared with like three people like help he gave me the option to wild shape with the dragons yeah. <laughs> i don't know what to do with myself you got to turn into a dragon in space how cool is that it was yeah. really cool it was freaking awesome and i loved it because it was just yeah really over the top and really amazing yeah. Yeah, and that, that was kind of my aim to to uh, i thought okay it's the last game let's go all in um yeah, so probably people who are listening who are, uh, uh, let's say, D&D &D purists, they're like, what? Wild chip into a dragon? Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you know, we had fun with it. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, what about you, Staya? Uh, how, what did you think of the well, ending? For me, the, the best part of the ending was still uh, if we could trust Marijn's character. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think the day before I made a convincing speech about join the forces of light, mm -hmm. step away from the shadow, etc. Yeah. And then uh, during that 
final combat, we still didn't know if you could trust him or not. <laughs> still considering killing him. Yeah. Uh, and that was loads of fun. Uh, yeah. Also, the special powers you gave us. Uh, my rogue found a good deity. Uh, I also showed Marijn's character immediately like, okay, Dolara, the, the god of sunlight, etc. Mm. says hello, <laughs> look at me. Yeah. I'm not a rogue anymore, I'm a paladin. Yeah. Uh, he <laughs> does good stuff for you if you trust him. And that was so much fun to play and think about, okay, yeah. do we have to kill him, yes or no? Uh, mm. And yeah. the, the last bit I, uh, I really liked is the short epilogue he did at the end of the session. Mm. Yeah. Like, where did all our characters end up a year later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun. And uh, I think that's an important aspect of an ending. It has to feel, at least in my mind, like you're, you know, like you're watching this long movie and uh, kind of the, the main adventure is over. If you then go straight to the titles and the names, it's, yeah. Sometimes you're missing something then. Uh, you want some sort of satisfying moment where you think, you know, what happened to this guy or this girl or this drow thing? Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, what about you, Mike? Um, well, I want to, to start off, I really thoroughly enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a great session. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think it would have been better as two separate sessions. Uh, yeah. Because it, to me, it felt like it was designed as two sessions and it became one session. Yeah. Uh, because you, as a dungeon master, you clearly put a tremendous amount of effort into that preparing that session and, and uh -huh. building up to it. Yeah. And you had a lot of loose ends from character arcs to, to tie up in this ending. Yeah. Uh, if you wanted to wrap up as well, you had some NPC cameos from an undead dragon, some dwarves, uh, yeah. and a drow. Yeah. You had two battle maps prepared, a, a uh -huh. very creative uh, final battle. Mm. Um, but I don't think they all got the attention they deserved in yeah. the long session that it ended up being. It was a bit rushed. Yeah. 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 I, th I think it would have been interesting to give all these different elements that you concocted and prepared some mm. more time to breathe. And yeah. I don't think a single long session was enough yeah. to really, to really do that. Yeah. Again, kudos to your preparation because mm. you know too much good stuff <laughs> is yeah, yeah. not necessarily <laughs> a bad thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, but definitely. I think it would have been been better for us as players and for yourself yeah. as a dungeon master to um, to prevent yeah. you from from losing track of things, yeah. uh, all these things going on at once, all these NPCs coming in at different times. Yeah, I, I was a bit wrung out by the end of it. Yeah. yeah. But again, <laughs> that being said, it was one hell of an ending. It was mm. a, a deserved ending. The entire campaign was definitely building up to it. You had yeah. prepared for it, everything. Mm -hmm. It was a fitting ending, and I really enjoyed it. Just just a little bit more time to breathe for all these different yeah. elements would have been better. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, again, too much of a good thing. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, and then we get to the, uh, the traditional, by now, uh, last question of my interview, uh, which is, uh, who is your RPG hero? And why? Um, yeah. Uh, who wants to take this one first? I'll go first, if that's right. Yep, um, sure. I technically have two because I couldn't decide. That's cheating. <laughs> no, <laughs> Am I allowed to do that? Uh, the first one is Guy Sklanders, uh, mm. who you've actually interviewed on this podcast before. That's yep. a big talk for you there. Mm -hmm. um, he is the person who runs the YouTube channel called How to Be a Great GM which is a fantastic resource for game masters and sometimes players to really refine their skills as a dungeon master or a player. And almost every single video he puts out is, some, is one I bookmarked for like, oh shit, I've got to rewatch this at some point in the future because it's yeah. relevant. Yeah. And he puts out a lot of videos. So that's, that's very amazing. He's very charismatic and very intelligent and uh, puts out good content. Yeah. And secondly is, of course, everyone's favorite, Matt Mercer, um, ah. because uh, about a year ago, I started getting into Critical Role, um, and the characters he comes up with, the world building he prepares, and the amazing voice acting he puts on display is just awe-inspiring. It's, it's, he, he's unmatched, in my opinion, in so many areas that he's just a, a real idol for me. And what I love about that guy is that he despite all his fame, etc., that he, he seems very down to earth, nice guy, just, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Very, very honest, very open, mm -hmm. um, nothing sinister about him or hidden things. Just yeah. that's who he is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, what about Kirsten? 
Uh, yeah, class. After this campaign, I can only say it's you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I I love to play, but I'm not uh, I'm not following anyone on YouTube or mm. stuff like that. So I really yeah. don't know. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Well, thank you. That's high praise. Uh, all right, Yurin, what about you? I'm uh, going to go with uh, Laura the Lawmaster or Creative Lawful Inc. on uh, Twitter. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. She is my 5 EDM, and uh, she's just a sweetheart. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope she hears this. Um, <laughs> the campaign she made is awesome, um, and by the time this goes up, uh, there is a high chance that our first Twitch stream is already up. So. Ah, all right. So you're I'm excited. You're... Yeah, I can imagine. All right. So you're playing live on the or on, on Twitch? Yeah. Or... Okay. yeah, we're going to be playing live. Wow. Interesting. Uh, send us a link and I'll put it in I the will, show notes. As soon yeah. as it's there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Cool. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, what about Staya? Oh, you, class. <laughs> I can't, oh. can't think oh. of anyone else. No. <laughs> uh, I think maybe sometimes players forget, but we, you, we bring our character sheets to the table and we start playing yeah. and I, I believe you put in so, so much effort, so much time in preparing the story arcs for each of our characters, uh, the battle maps, F, I, it's so much and uh, I don't want to know how much time you spent on preparing for us, but it's appreciated because it elevates our story, it inspires us to play. So uh, any DM that does this as well as you do, mm. keep them. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, you know, and but the thing is that yeah, it looks like a lot of work, uh, but as long as it's enjoyable, it's not really work. You know, for me, it's uh, a way to uh, to pass the time, and you know, when when I have a I don't know like half an hour uh, between things, that my mind tends to go in that direction. Um, yeah, but yeah, thanks. I mean, all that appreciation is uh, wonderful, of course. And the thing is, like I said at the beginning of the episode, or well, beginning of the uh, interview, is that yeah, I, that would have would not have been possible um, without the cool characters. You know, the, I mean, you guys gave me so much material to work with because what I did, um, just to go back to what Mike said about Guy Sclanders, one cool thing about Guy is that he um, he invented this sentence. Um, that you can use to to build your campaign off of, which is basically, uh, I'm going to ruin it now, but it's something like um, uh, somebody wants something badly and is having trouble getting it, um, and that that is the whole ba the whole sentence that this campaign was was uh, built on. <laughs> so that basically the the big bad wanted to get um, whatever you guys found there on that comet in space. And he had trouble getting it because he didn't have the pieces of the tablet. And he had more trouble getting it because you started interfering. Um, so that, that's really the whole campaign. <laughs> so when you think about it, it's nothing. But, um, you know, you brought it to life. And a lot of the uh, adventures that I prepared, I hadn't thought of beforehand until you guys did stuff. And I thought, oh, okay, I guess I now need to do this. Uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of action reaction there. Yeah. Um, okay. And then we go last but not least to Marijn. Yeah, I, I really can't talk about RPG heroes without highlighting the GM here. Uh, yeah. And that goes for our hosts of this podcast tonight. But it also goes for... Uh, any of you GMs like listening at home, anybody willing to spend that much time in creating this, this labor of love that is a campaign uh, should be highlighted. Um, but if I move on to who I would have to put forward as my one uh, RPG hero, I think I'd have to go to my sister, um, which is interesting because I never actually played a game with her. But um, uh, I just remember as a kid, when um, I was small, uh, I just came into the living room and there was this stack of books, which was higher than I was at that time. Mm -hmm. And I was just fascinated by the whole concept of these people coming together and like looking to um, tell a story together. And I never managed to make it work before this campaign, but the idea already always stuck with me. I always yeah. wanted to play the game and I just started casually throwing out there that I was interested and yes. um, at one point I met somebody who was willing to say hey I have a campaign you might fit in well there yeah. uh, 
So, but um, yeah, that, that's, um, she really was an inspiration to join this hobby and also help me with creating the character. It's just mm. drowning in my character sheets. Like yeah. just need to be a plus three or a plus five. And she just yeah. says, put it down. What would you like to play? Yeah, which yeah. is a much more important question. And having just somebody like that to really guide me through this character creation process was yeah. absolutely vital to be able yeah. to put towards like the, the end result that we managed to make. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I have to say, I think if, 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 um, if I would have to, uh, admit to any shortcomings of my own, I, I would say it's guiding new players. I think I didn't spend a lot of time explaining anything to anyone. <laughs> It's just like, okay, well, you know, you can find the rules online and just make a character. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's something that if I would start with another group um, with people who haven't played before, that I should spend quite a lot more energy on is making sure they're comfortable with the rules and with uh, the things that their characters can do. Yeah. You're, not, you're not cheating on us, are you? Uh, no. No, <laughs> no, no, hypothetical. <laughs> no. <laughs> No way, man. <laughs> Someone's a little possessive, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, so um, uh, that nicely wraps up uh, this wonderful interview. Uh, Actually, so... I have one more question about the campaign. Oh, dear. And this is something that I've been wanting to ask you about, but never had really had the chance to. Uh -huh. Okay. So, um, well, there was this moment when somebody here rolled a natural one, mm -hmm. which due to a sequence of events led to the unfortunate demise of my character. Yes. Um, so this is the first character I've ever created in, uh -huh. in, in D and D. Yeah. And it um, was rather interesting to me that when this character ended up dying, mm -hmm. I felt a genuine like sense of loss there. Yeah. That somehow this, what started as some scribblings on paper ended up really mattering yeah. And um, I, I also sent you a message about that saying, hey, you mm -hmm. killed off my character. Yeah. Um, and I'm not happy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was okay with the result because it's all part of the drama. I, like, I really li like, liked it. Um, mm -hmm. I also don't want my character to have plot immunity. And I definitely like the way where that developed with Hados. It was absolutely amazing. Wouldn't yeah. trade it for the world. No. But well, that must have been an unfortunate uh, or a very uncomfortable moment for you where I basically faced you with, hey, yeah, this is, how did you deal with that? Yeah, that, that, I remember getting that message and thinking, hmm, yeah, that was kind of shitty. Like it, you, you, your character died through no fault of your own um, because one other character crashed the airship. Uh, <coughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, you, you, you just ended up standing in a perfect line for a lightning bolt. I thought, well, it's just too beautiful not to do it. Um, <laughs> and you know, I'm not an adversarial dungeon master, uh, but at the same time, I thought, okay, well, this dragon would definitely do this. Um, so he did. And um, I think I underestimated a little bit the ridiculous amount of damage it, it did and the squishiness of uh, the characters who were standing there. Um, yeah, so when you sent me that message, I, I did feel mild remorse, I guess. Like, ooh, maybe that wasn't so cool. Um, <clears throat> but I'm also not a big fan of turning back the time and then saying, oh, it didn't happen. Because I, I remember that happened once at a big uh, live roleplay event that I was part of, uh, that some characters died in, in this big fight and they were very unhappy with it. And then the, the game masters just rolled back time. So, okay, it didn't happen. I'm like, yeah, but... That's no fun. Um, yeah, so... I, yeah, exactly, because yeah. there, it was definitely, you know, a low light in the, the moment of my life, uh, or the light of my <laughs> life of my character, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, but it's, it's really, it, it also opened up the doors for so much new. So you're, all, you're also there to discuss about, hey, how do we take this from here? And yeah. how do we tie this? And yeah. uh, somehow that morphed into... Uh, me now suddenly being at the helm of this crazy uh, uh, evil sorcerer who is yeah. definitely a worse fit for the party. Yeah. But I guess yeah. there's some irony in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the funny That's secret it. was that we, I, I gave you the uh, later, much later, the option to, uh, to have him come back like a Gandalf the White type situation, <laughs> which was fun for mm -hmm. the five minutes that it lasted. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Class, can I ask you what was your highlight for our campaign? Oof. 
what was my highlight well yeah that's a tough question because uh, i mean i i enjoyed the the whole thing very much um but it, it, for me that the most interesting parts were when things just kind of happen organically and i don't have to do much so the 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 play between the characters for me uh was definitely the the, the those were the, the highlights for me um and the crazy combats etc i tend to um you get so absorbed by it when you're running the game uh, that you kind of forget about the cool things that happen in combat. But the, the the role play, the moments that you you guys were really really in character and having discussions or almost fights sometimes, um, yeah, th those those were highlights for me definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, thanks very much for guiding us all through this experience. It's been. Uh, and then, uh, just an amazing adventure no problem at all uh, i'll do it again because <laughs> we're going to play uh, forbidden lands definitely i was just about to bring up do you want to like uh, tease your players about our next campaign or is it something <laughs> you want to uh, keep secret for now we'll do that offline <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for, uh, for your time and um, for this interview. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to our next campaign already. Well, that was a hectic interview at, uh, at times, uh, but uh, very, very interesting. And if there's one main takeaway from all of this, I think that uh, whenever you run a campaign for a bunch of people, as a game master, I think it pays off to ask them very for very specific feedback on different elements of the game. Um, because, I mean, of course, I, I already asked them for feedback, but not this specifically and not in this much detail. And I got so much back uh, that will help me to prepare the next campaign for this same group of people and also help me prepare games in general. Uh, because I, I can tell that some of the things that I did worked really well and some of the things maybe not so well and and uh, I think that's super valuable um, so yeah and of course uh, the other takeaway I think is that it's just totally worth it um, to to spend this amount of time together around the gaming table whether it's a physical table or a virtual one uh, because if you see their reactions it's just wonderful to hear uh, so yeah I'll, uh, I'll leave it at that and that's it for episode 23. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording. If you did, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps to get the podcast get heard. Want to keep up with the latest news about my podcast? Hop on over to Twitter at RPGHeroes1. Check out the full show notes with all the links at rpgheroes.buzzsprout.com. Want to support the show and other supporters of my Discord channel? Then I would be honored if you check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash rpgheroes. You can also buy RPG products with my affiliate code. Check the show notes. Two weeks from now, I'll be talking to Justin Alexander of the Alexandrian blog. Until next time, stay heroic. <laughs>